Now we are completing this evening our consideration of this uh, final section of this first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans which runs from verse 18 uh, to the end of the chapter. The apostle says that he glories in the gospel and is ready to preach it not only because of its own intrinsic worth and merit but because the wrath of God has also been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men that hold the truth in unrighteousness. And we have been seeing that the wrath of God is revealed for these two reasons, because of the character of sin, ungodliness and unrighteousness, but also because men have deliberately held down the truth. God had revealed the truth concerning himself, not the full truth concerning himself, but sufficient to render mankind inexcusable. He had done so in creation, he had done so in providence, he had done so in history. We were considering that last Friday night. But in spite of that, though God had revealed himself, and man is thus without excuse, man because of his unrighteousness, because of his sin, had restrained or had resisted, suppressed the truth. And we ended last Friday evening by asking this question, why had he done that? And we found that Paul gives us three answers. First of all, it is men's pride. You remember the phrase in which he puts it, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Man is always anxious to be a philosopher professing themselves to be wise. That was the first thing, pride. The second thing was wickedness. In other words, uh, it was this unrighteousness, this uh, delight in evil and in sin. And the third thing was that uh, they lost their spiritual sense. Their foolish heart was darkened. They lost their spiritual understanding. Very well. There then is the position at which we've arrived. Mankind holds down the truth, suppresses the truth, and that is why man does so. But now we must go on to consider this. How exactly has man done that? Having seen the things in men in sin that makes him do it, how does he do it? And here again the apostle gives us the answer, and they're perfectly plain. Now, let me show you the teaching of this paragraph. I've divided it up into two headings. First of all, he tells us that uh, mankind has suppressed the truth that God has revealed, first of all, in its attitude towards God. Now, these are the phrases. Take verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, that's the first thing. Having this knowledge of God in creation, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen uh, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. In spite of that, mankind does not glorify God as God. That just means this, that mankind doesn't praise God doesn't give him his rightful place in its life and in its thought. In other words, man in sin does not live to the glory of God. Man made God for his own glory's sake and in order that men might glorify him. The heavens are telling the glory of God, the whole of creation does, but the very acme of God's creation is man whom he made in his own image. And man, above everything else, was meant to show forth the glory of God. But as the man who wrote the 104th Psalm tells us, it is man alone who doesn't do that. Read that psalm. It's the most wonderful psalm on this very theme. He'll show you how everything in creation manifests the glory of God by obeying the law of its nature. Man alone doesn't do so. So he ends by saying, let the sinner be consumed from the earth. 
The one who was meant to manifest God's glory above everything else is the one who fails. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Their whole attitude towards him is antagonistic. Indeed, as Paul puts it later on in the 8th chapter of this epistle, the natural mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God. Very well, but it doesn't stop at that. Not only do they not glorify him, but he says also, neither were thankful. I needn't stay with these things. We all know what they mean. We've all been so guilty of every one of them. Man doesn't thank God for his mercy, for his goodness, for his kindness and all his dealings with us in providence. We take the sunshine for granted. We are annoyed if we don't get it. We take the rain for granted. How often do we thank God for all these gifts and blessings? Now, if we as Christians fail in this respect, how much more so does the world fail? God sendeth his rain, as our Lord reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount, and the sun upon the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. But mankind doesn't realize that he doesn't stop to thank God. Neither were thankful. He is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. He is the father of mercies. And yet people go through the whole of their lives in this world and they never thank him. Neither were thankful. Ignore him completely. That's how they show this attitude of theirs towards God. It's in this way they suppress the truth that has been revealed concerning God. And then there's a most extraordinary statement in verse 28, which is the third way in which mankind does this. Listen. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, I'm interested in the first part of the statement. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. What does that mean? Well, the Revised Standard Version puts it like this. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. But even that's much too weak. What it really means is this. They did not approve of God. Because the word that the apostle uses is this. It's the word that is used for testing. It was the word that was employed for testing metals, gold and so on. Uh, a lump of material was put on your desk and the question is, is this gold or is it not? Is it of value or isn't it? They tested it by various tests. That's the word that he used. You apply tests. And what the apostle is saying is this. That mankind having... That God, having examined him, having tested him, decided to reject him. Like the scientist who, given this lump, says, no, this isn't pure gold. This is an alloy. Throw it away. That's the attitude of mankind towards God. They consider God. They are the judges, you see. And God is a subject for examination. Oh, yes, this is very interesting. Now, let's, uh, let's see about this. Uh, God, oh, yes, you say you believe in God. And so they consider God. They're going to examine God. They're going to test God. And having done so, and in spite of this full knowledge, which God has given in that particular manner, they decide that they're not interested. It's not worth their while to bother any longer about God. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote this, remember, 1900 years ago. But you see what a perfect description it is of mankind this evening? How interesting to have a discussion about religion and to talk about God. Should God do this or shouldn't he do that? And what I think about God. They examine God and reject him. They did not like to retain him in their knowledge. What an appalling state. What a terrible condition. That is the state of mankind in sin. They did not think it worth their while to retain God in their knowledge. They deliberately put him on one side. And it is still what man does in sin. And the fourth thing they did is this. The thing that's mentioned in verse 32, the last verse. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. 
What does that mean? It means this. That they deliberately ignore their knowledge of God's judgment on sin. I needn't stay with this. We touched it last Friday evening. There is in every human being a sense of right and wrong. There is a conscience. There is a feeling that if we do certain things, we are going to be punished. And that we deserve to be punished. But in spite of knowing that, mankind not only does such things, but it rejoices and has pleasure in them that do them. In other words, men not only do these things, they talk about them and they joke about them, they boast about them. One has to sit and listen to it in railway compartments, especially in restaurant cars, I find. Men, actually intelligent men, boasting about their drinking, drinking and things like that, have pleasure in them that do them. Not only make beasts of themselves, but rather like to tell the story and to enjoy it as they tell one another. That's the position. And this is done deliberately, in spite, says the apostle, of what they know. They act in this way and in this manner. Well, now, there it is, if you like, in theory. That is their attitude towards God. But what is it in practice? Well, in practice, he tells us it's this. They not only have put on one side this full knowledge which they have of God. Now, I keep on repeating that word, you notice, because that is the word that Paul uses in verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now, the word translated knowledge here really means full knowledge. What, what it means is the knowledge that God has given of himself in the revelation. And what he says is, therefore, that having decided that they don't want this full knowledge of God that God has given, they now decide to make their own gods and to worship them. You see, in a sense, they don't want to finish with the idea of God altogether. But they don't want God as he is. They don't want God as he has revealed himself. So what they do now is they're going to make their own God or their own God. And here the apostle tells us in verses 23 and 25 as to how they have done that. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, what does this mean? Well, you notice how he puts it. They reject the glory of the uncorruptible God. Uncorruptible means this, of course, that there is no element of decay. It's a reference to God's eternity from everlasting to everlasting. It's a, a reference to God's spirituality. It is a reference indeed to God's glorious attributes in all their plenitude and fullness. The immortal God they set on one side. The glorious God they reject. And what do they do? They make gods for themselves. What sort of gods? Well, you've seen photographs of some of the heathen images, haven't you? Some of them look like men, as Paul tells us here. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And as has often been pointed out, haven't you noticed how hideous all these images are? These gods in human likeness and in human forms, they're not even decent human beings, as it were. There's something vile and foul and horrible about them. You look at, at these images and you'll see what I mean. Well, some of them they've made in the form of men. But they haven't stopped even at that. Some of them they make in the form of birds. Some of them in the form of four-footed beasts. Cows and sheep. They've set these things up as God. Golden calves. And they're still doing that sort of thing. The sacred animal and so on. And even creeping things like snakes and lizards 
and things of that kind. All these things have been turned into gods and they've made their images in these forms. And then having made them, they proceed to worship them. This is a part of the process. This is how men has done all this. But then in verse 25, he puts it in a slightly different form. They change the truth of God, he says, into a lie. What he means is that they have turned what is the truth about God into something that they think is the truth, which is actually not the truth. In other words, it is a lie. What's he referring to? Well, he's referring, if you like, to mythology. All Greek mythology and other mythologies and so on, with their talk about gods, all, that's the thing the apostle has got in his mind here. And in addition to that, superstitions and all the various forms of idolatry. And of course, in doing all this, you see, they have been putting the creature before the creator himself. Now, what mankind has done in sin, therefore, you see, can be put in this form. Man in sin sets on one side the essential glory of God, the real truth about God. He sets aside God's spirituality, his infinity, his, inter his eternity, his majesty, and the fact that God is spirit, that he's immaterial. But they materialize him. They give him a bodily form, an appearance. You see, in doing all this, they're simply denying the truth about God. The whole of mythology, the whole of idolatry, all superstition is nothing but a lie. It is an attempt to reduce the eternal, everlasting, glorious God of heaven into terms that are comprehensible by men and that can be handled by men. That's what the apostle says. Instead of receiving and accepting God's revelation of himself, they substitute their own ideas of God. And having put them up, they bow down to them and worship them. In those olden times, and still in certain parts of the world today, they do it, as I say, literally in making their gods out of wood and stone and precious metals and so on. But in principle, the same thing is being done by philosophy. They substitute their own ideas, and every time they do so, they are detracting from the glory of God. In other words, no image, no picture can ever represent God. It's always a detraction from his glory. And any attempt, therefore, to represent God, as the Ten Commandments tell, tell, tell us, is guilty of this lie about God. You must make no graven image to represent God even. It's always a detraction from him. And the apostle puts this in these sublime words, in verse 25, which we're looking at. Who changed the truth about God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Have you ever been surprised at this amen that suddenly comes like this in the middle of a passage? Why do you think the apostle said amen at that point? Well, of course, the explanation is simple. It's this. The apostle thinks in contradistinction to all these images and idols and all these lies about God as he really is. And he pauses in worship and in adoration and in praise. And thereby, I think, he teaches us a very great lesson. The very name of God should be an object of reverence. You know that the Jews didn't use the name Jehovah. They felt it was too sacred. Somehow or another we've lost this. But the apostle calls us back to it here. The very thought of God in his transcendence, in his majesty and infinity, and in his glory should humble us. 
We should speak of him with reverence and with godly fear. Amen, says the apostle. In other words, in the midst of his argument, he contemplates God and his silence and as it were forgets his own argument for a moment because you can't speak of God like that. You've got to stop and worship him at the very mention of his name. Very well, let us learn these simple lessons as we pass. We put the creature before the creator. Every time we put any single idea of our own before the revelation of scripture. I feel like repeating that. To put any idea of our own before scripture is to be guilty of this very thing, of putting the creature before the creator. Our ideas, rather than what the Bible says, or what God has revealed. Ah, we say, but I don't understand that. I don't quite see how God would be fair if he did this and that. All right. That's what you say. That's what you think. The question is, what is revealed? What does God say about himself? My friends, we are not meant to understand all we read in the scriptures. It's beyond us. Our minds are too small, and we are born in sin. We come to this as little children, not to comprehend it all, but to worship and to praise. We receive it. And if you start putting your ideas, your difficulties, your thoughts, your feelings before the scripture, you've already partly become guilty of this terrible, horrible charge of putting and worshipping the creature before the creator. Let us, I say, therefore always... Approach the word of God with reverence and with humility. Let us never come to it or read it without praying to be illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Let us come to learn, not to have our own prejudices confirmed or to turn something down. Let us come, I say, with open minds. Let us receive the word, lest in our modern fashion we may be guilty of this very thing with which the apostle charges those people of ancient time. And above all, I say, let us ever as we think of him and talk about him, remember who he is and what he is. We forget that sometimes, don't we? Something's been going wrong. Like that man in the 73rd Psalm, we've been having a hard time and the ungodly is very prosperous. And we begin to say, Why does God? Oh, my dear friend, the next time that thought or feeling arises in your breast, stop for a moment and remember you're thinking and speaking about the uncorruptible God, the Creator who is blessed forever, this glorious being, glorious in His holiness, infinite in his majesty. Let us put our hands upon our mouths and be content to wait until he reveals his purpose to us. How dangerous it is to speak without thinking about God, the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's stop for a moment. God forbid that we should ever be guilty of speaking about God in a manner that is unworthy. However, we must press on. Now that is how mankind has suppressed the truth. The next matter, therefore, we consider is this. The results of doing that. What has all this led to? Again, let me summarize the teaching of the Apostle for you. The first thing he tells us is this, that as a result of all this and doing all this, men have become fools, verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. How easy it would be to spend not only the rest of this evening, but many evenings in just expounding that. Men and women in sin, there's only one thing to say about them. They're fools. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And anybody who says there is no God is nothing but a fool. 
How do we see that? How do we know that? Well, the apostle has just uh, been telling us in the words I've been quoting to you. You see, any man who thinks that he can examine God and having done so can dismiss him, is just saying that he's a fool. May I put that in the form of an illustration? You will hear people saying sometimes that they just see nothing at all in Beethoven's music. But they think jazz is marvelous. Now, they tell me nothing about Beethoven, but they tell me a great deal about themselves. They don't realize it, of course. They think they're being clever. But they're really just telling us all about themselves from the standpoint of a knowledge of music, aren't they? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Yes, and it's not only in this fact that they think that they're capable of assessing God and dismissing him. Look what they worship. Is that wisdom? Is it wisdom to bow down before an idol? Or something in the form of a, a lizard, or a cow, or a, a calf? Is that wisdom? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They say they can't believe in God, but they can believe in evolution. With all its contradictions and all its monstrosities, they can believe that. They'll swallow that. They say, I can't swallow a miracle. But look what they swallow when they accept the theory of evolution. They can't believe in God, they say. But they seem to believe in astrology, don't they? They don't believe that there's a great God deciding men's fate and determining everything. But they believe the stars do that. Is that wisdom? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They won't worship the God of heaven. They feel that's degrading. They'll worship a human leader, the leader cult. We've seen it in Hitlerism, Mussoliniism, Stalinism, and indeed in other ways which I could mention, but perhaps I'd better not. The tendency almost to defy certain great men, I'm not sure we're not partly guilty of it in this country, as if they were gods and can do no wrong. Leader worship. Is that wisdom? Oh, they think it's very insulting to ask them to bow down before God. And yet they will worship men and women. We read about the so-called fans that people have in various professions. I shall never forget reading about 20 years ago, I suppose by now, a certain famous film star died. And one read in the newspaper that a number of women, when they read that, literally fainted. You remember it? Is that wisdom? They'll stand for hours to see these people. They'll stay up all night. It's insulting to give time to God, but this is all right. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Indeed, there is no question about it that there are many people in the world today who are worshipping animals. They talk to them as if they were human beings. They won't go away without them. They're worried about them. They live for them. And when the animals should die, they're lost. They don't know what to do. I'm not romancing these things are facts. Professing themselves to be wise, they dismiss the God of heaven the glorious everlasting being, and this is what they do instead. But come, they're not only fools, they're also foul. Listen to verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves. Oh, the foulness of sin, the uncleanness of it all, the squalor, the way they even dishonor the body that God has given us. But then in verse 26 I read this, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, 
And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. We needn't go into these things. Alas, unfortunately, we all know more than we should know perhaps about these things. And our modern world is full of them. Vile affections. Horrible perversions. But people are defending them. They're even trying to say there's something marvelous about them. There's something really beautiful. They say it isn't sin. Ah, they say you've been too harsh on all this. It's being defended today. Things which are not convenient, I read here. In verse 28, it means things contrary to nature. Violating the law of man's physical being. Improper. They're not only fools, but they're foul. And let's be clear about it and use plain language as the apostle does. Life today has become foul. There's no other word to use. Indeed, he goes on to say that it's also become vile and violent and vicious. I'm summarizing verses 29 to 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I say it's vile, it's violent, it's vicious. But that is the result, you see, of dismissing God as you and putting your own ideas up. This is the result of not glorifying him as God, nor being thankful to him, but exalting your own wisdom, your own mind and understanding. That's what it leads to. Fools, foul, vile, vile and vicious. And we are seeing it all in this modern world. You see, it doesn't matter whether it happened at the flood or whether it happened at this point nearly 2,000 years ago, or whether it happens now. It's always the same. These things are universal. That's why I don't gallop through the epistle to the Romans. You see, this word is speaking to, to England today, to the whole world at this moment. And we've got to face these things. And we must bring others to see them. Because finally, the apostle tells us here about God's view of it all. And God's judgment on it all. You see the steps and the stages? Because of their pride and their wickedness and their spiritual darkness, that is what they do. And that leads to these results. And what does God say about it all? Well, the apostle answers in three statements. It's the same statement, rarely repeated three times. It's first of all in verse 24. Wherefore, because of this, God also gave them up. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up. God gave them over. It doesn't matter which, it's the same word. Three times over it's there. The apostle was so anxious that this should be understood that he repeats it, you see. He says it three times over. Men are so ready to forget it and to ignore it. The apostle wants them to be perfectly clear about it. When mankind refuses to glorify God as God, when mankind doesn't thank him and praise him and worship him as it ought, 
and in its cleverness dismisses him, throws him out. What God does is to do exactly the same to mankind. There's a play on words in this 28th verse. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God did not like to retain them, but gave them up, left them to themselves. They abandoned God. God abandoned them. That's what he's saying. So in other words, what we have here is an account of God's judicial abandonment of men in sin. God abandoned them. And you notice he even abandoned them in their minds, which is the most terrifying and terrible thing of all. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, in their great brains that they're always talking about, God gave them over to a reprobate, a rejected mind, a foolish mind, a mind that's fooling itself constantly and going round and round in circles and really has lost its power of apprehending truth. God has abandoned them to that. So that the tragedy of men in the world today is not only that he is debased in his conduct, he is debased in his mind. He can't think straightly. That's why he tries to justify these vile things and tries to explain them in terms of biology or, or psychology and so on and to say, you know, this isn't sin. This is really something medical and perhaps not even that. Perhaps after all, it's really the height of beauty. Reprobate mind. And when a man's mind has gone like that, there's no hope for him. There's nothing to appeal to. But then you see, the second thing he tells us that God has done is this in verse 27. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. Then here's the phrase. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. If you like, you can put it like this. God abandons men because of his wrong attitude. And the result of God abandoning men is that men behaves in the way that we've been looking at. That's the recompense of their error that is meet and fitting. In other words, it is God who preserves morality in this world. Man in his foolish pride thinks that he can preserve morality without God. They've been preaching that a great deal for the last hundred years. But you see what happens? It always happens. Man cannot preserve morality. When he tries to do so, this is what you get as a result. These perversions and all that we are witnessing in the world today. It is God alone that can preserve morality. And when God withdraws himself, you see what happens. You enter into this vileness and filth and foulness. And that is what they deserve, says Paul. That is the recompense that is meet for such creatures. God withdraws his restraining grace and all the foulness and the vileness that is in men as the result of sin is given free scope. It's let loose. And the world becomes a kind of living hell. Very well then, let me make my final comments which are these. The world as it is this evening is the greatest proof possible of the wrath of God against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men that hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Our world this very evening with its baffling moral problems with its incredible moral muddle, with all the loudness and the ugliness and the foulness which is increasing. It's just an absolute proof of what the Apostle says here. It is God's wrath against sin. You can't explain it in any other terms. I defy you to. 
There is no other explanation. You see, we'd been taught that uh, education and culture and moral lectures and moral societies were going to do it, but they can't do it, and they're not doing it. No, no. This is a part of the wrath of God against sin. So the modern world proves itself that the doctrine which it hates above every doctrine, the doctrine of the wrath of God, is actually a fact. Because the wrath of God manifests itself in that way, that God withdraws his restraining grace and abandons men to himself. And the result is what we see. My other comment is this. Hell is just that exaggerated and going on to all eternity. That is hell. Hell is a condition in which life is lived outside God and all the restraint of God's holiness. And that's what it is. All this that you've got described here, exaggerated, still worse, and going on endlessly. In other words, hell is people living to all eternity, the kind of life they're living now, only that it's much more so. That's hell. Can you imagine anything worse? It's men and women without any control at all. Finally abandoned by God. He gave them over. He gives them over eternally. And they're just left to themselves and to manifest all that is in them of this foulness and vileness. I don't know what you feel, my friends, but I feel this as I say these things. Thank God for Romans 1, 16 and 17. In the light of all this, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What else could have saved any one of us from such a condition and from such a hell? Thank God for it. And thank God that he's ever opened our eyes to see it. Ah, yes, but the inevitable corollary. What of the men and women who are still in it? Are we content just to go on enjoying our salvation and our knowledge and our position? All mankind outside Christ comes into this passage. They're not all equally foul, but they don't glorify him as God, and they don't thank him. And they're in the same company, and they'll spend eternity in the same company. The most respectable people, as well as the vilest, they all are in the same group. If we believe these things, we must not only have a great heart of compassion for them, as we see their appalling condition, and as we see what awaits them, we must pray God so to manifest this power of his in the gospel. We must so pray, I say, for revival and for reawakening, for the power of the Holy Ghost to open the eyes of men and women ere it be too late. If we really believe this teaching, we will all go from this service tonight determined no longer to live a life of ease and of rest and of enjoyment. We must feel the burden of the souls that are round and about us by the million. In this condition, we can't do anything about them. It's no use going to talk merely into reason. It needs the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. It was the only thing that availed in the time of Paul. He didn't preach with enticing words of men's wisdom. He preached in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And nothing else will touch it. They won't listen to anything else. It has no effect finally. But the power of the Holy Ghost can and does and will. Let us plead, let us yearn for God to visit us with revival power. 
Not all who were privileged to preach the gospel and all individual Christians as they talk to men and women may open their eyes to these things but may go on to tell them of the power of God into salvation of the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ which can make the foulest clean of the blood of Christ his perfect righteousness and obedience with which they can be clothed, that they can be washed, that they can be sanctified, that they can be justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the power of the Spirit of God. Oh, may God imprint these things so deeply upon our minds and hearts that we shall be so burdened and pray God to have mercy and to give yet another opportunity ere it be too late. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come again with humble praise and thanksgiving to thank thee that thou hast opened our eyes to see these things. Our desperate condition and the glory and the fullness and the power of the gospel. Oh God, we know not how to thank thee. We are debtors to thy mercy and love. Oh, hear us as we pray for those who are without for all were still blinded by sin and Satan and are held still in this foul bondage and captivity. God, have mercy upon them. O oh Lord, we pray and beseech thee, revive thy word. Manifest again the power that was seen here in this city of London 200 years ago in that great evangelical awakening when men corresponding to what we have read of this evening were by the thousands saved and delivered under the preaching of thy servants filled with the Holy Ghost. We know that thou art still the same, that thine arm is not shortened. O oh God, revive thy work and come in Pentecostal power. And unto thee and unto thee alone shall we give all the praise and all the honor and all the glory in the name of thy dear Son, our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit Abide and continue with us now this night until, if it be thy will, we meet again in October throughout the remainder of this our short, uncertain earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall stand before thee face to face and enter into thine eternal and everlasting glory. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.